Chapter 15. 3 a.m. UTC minus 6, 10 a.m. UTC plus 1. In my room in the Cyprus Regional Hospital, I wasn't sleeping. Reasons? 1. I'd been awakened in the last chronological hour by the emergency with the man who had occupied the room with me. 2. I can't believe they kicked me out like that at the prefecture! The nurse looked in. Trouble sleeping? I nodded. Woke up when my roommate was... How's he doing? He's having some difficulties, the nurse answered cautiously. But you need to get some sleep. Are you experiencing any pain? I did notice a headache when I thought about it. The nurse went for a dose of painkiller and soon returned. She examined the intravenous needle in my forearm. I don't think you'll need this anymore, and you'll sleep more comfortably without it, she said. I gladly allowed her to remove it. The nurse left. I lay down and closed my eyes. The Line 5 metro train began slowing almost exactly at the moment I emerged from the day skip. Actually, several day skips, unnoticed because I'd slept through them. Gare de l'Est station. The train stopped. Passengers exited, passengers boarded. The train started. Next came Jacques Monsage station. The train stopped. Passengers exited, passengers boarded. The train started. Next, République. The train stopped. This time, I exited. Nice to be here again, I said, remembering my first visit to République station, a day and a half into the future. I found the Line 11 platform. It was 10.14 a.m. local time. I'm living the 3 a.m. Saskatchewan hour in this phase. By 10.20, I began to wonder why the Line 11 train hadn't appeared. It was only then I noticed an announcement scrolling across a display. Ligne 11 trains retardés. When my tired mind translated the meaning, my fists clenched with a surge of anger. Delayed? I have to get going, I fumed. And was promptly corrected. Why does this little thing anger me? Whose time am I worried about? Hasn't this whole event taught me that even time is not my own? I took a breath and sat quietly to wait. At 10.30 the Line 11 train arrived. It whisked me to Goncourt station. I climbed the steps to street level. The scene was familiar, even though, chronologically, I hadn't yet looked upon it. The way to the Hotel International was easy to remember. I went to the front desk and asked to stay in room 35. The agent informed me the room would be available in approximately one hour after the cleaners finished. Great, I replied, feeling exhausted but also hungry. May I leave my bags here? I'll get something to eat and come back in an hour. The agent agreed. I headed back to Avenue Parmentier and spotted a tavern across the street, Le Voyageur. Soon I was eating a great meal. I day-skipped. The mental and physical exhaustion I'd felt an instant before lifted immediately. I sat on a bench near the entrance to the Parmentier metro station. The cool morning air of Wednesday, January 7th filled my lungs. Now, on my way to Charlie Hebdo. Even though I'd memorized the directions five hours ago slash two days from then at the police prefecture, I brought the route up on my smartphone just to be sure. I started. Across the complicated intersection, three or four roads crossed in a complex pattern. Right on Rue Oberkampf. A ways ahead, the street bent left, southwestward. Left on Boulevard Richard Lenoir. I came to another complex intersection at Boulevard Voltaire and waited for a crossing light. The name Voltaire triggered a cascade of running thoughts as I walked once the traffic signals allowed. It's because of people like Voltaire, with his ideas about the separation of church and state, that a magazine like Charlie Hebdo can even exist. It's not friendly to any religious belief system. Yet here I am, on my way there, to do what I can, precisely because I believe God is real and ought to be served in the ways he calls us to. Hopefully, in this case, that will mean saving lives and helping to change history. I was also dimly aware of another unexpressed idea in my mind and soul. The time, 10.14 a.m. The street curved to the right. Another right onto Allée Verte, a short ways left on Rue Nicolas Appert. I stopped a few steps down the left-hand side of the street. Above a doorway set into the street level of a white four-story building was a faint tan. 
10. Nicolas Appel. This is Charlie Hebdo. 10.21 a.m. I swallowed hard, a characteristic habit before an action requiring faith, courage, or any number of other important qualities. I stepped forward into the doorway inset. Three doors presented themselves, a solid door to the right, an opaque glass door to the front, and a solid door with a window beside it to the left. All three had code locks. No one could be seen through the left-hand window. A stairway to upper levels could barely be seen through the clouded glass door. I did what most people would do when confronted with a locked door they wished to enter. I pressed the door buzzer by the middle glass door. Almost immediately, a gruff, we, oui, from the left made me jump. A man had appeared in the window. He spoke through an intercom. I saw that the man wore coveralls and held a screwdriver, a maintenance person. I attempted, in French, to speak my warning. J'ai entendu dire que ce bureau sera attaqué. S'il vous plaît, nous avons la sécurité, the man interjected. Avez-vous informé la police? Yes, I had informed the police, though with far less response than hoped for. When I nodded, the maintenance worker made a dismissive gesture with his hand. Donc, laissez la police faire leur travail. He disappeared from the window. Once again, I felt astounded how lightly information about an attack was treated. Okay, if that's what it is, then I will do what I must do. The time was now 10.31 a.m. According to my official plan, I knew I ought to seek a vantage point from which to report or video any important information. But the deeper idea, barely acknowledged to this point, asserted itself. I didn't seek a vantage point. Instead, I walked a few paces away from the door and leaned against the building to wait. I will do what I must do. The silence of the street felt tomb-like. I forced myself to breathe slowly and deliberately. At 10.41, a small black car came into view to my left and drove slowly along the one-way street. Two men were in the car, and as they passed, they both peered intently at the Charlie Hebdo entrance. One of the two glanced at me. My blood ran cold. But the car didn't stop. It turned right at the nearby corner. I was sweating, despite the cool temperature. Was that my imagination, or...? At 10.43, a woman and a young boy exited a nearby building. They didn't seem to be in a hurry. The boy was showing something to the woman. At 10.44, two men rounded a corner onto the street, walking slowly, deep in conversation. They stopped on the opposite side of the street and spoke face to face. I frowned at all this activity. No, go away, I inwardly shouted. At 10.51, the same black car returned from the same direction and again crawled along the street. The same two faces concentrated on the Charlie Hebdo location. The same man again looked at me. Once more, the car turned at the corner and disappeared from sight. That's got to be them, but why aren't they stopping? I looked around. The two men still stood across the street, talking. The lady and boy had moved a little farther down the block, but were now actually sitting on a bench and appeared to be eating something. A female worker from a business across the way had also joined the scene. She smoked a cigarette while leaning against the building, checking her phone. I knew a choice leaned upon me, to stay where I was and do what I could when the black car came and did not carry on, or to go and warn the people on the street to leave. I dithered in uncertainty. The awareness that a day skip approached didn't help. I prayed. I decided. I started toward the mother and son. They were talking and laughing as I approached. Excusez-moi! Troube! A chalet hebdo! Partez! I said with a gesture up the street. The mother looked concerned, although whether because of an excited stranger babbling to them or because of my message, I couldn't tell. I felt immense relief when the mother coaxed her son back toward the building from which they had come. I started across the street toward the two men and unexpectedly felt my car gliding forward. I jammed on the brakes and came to a forceful stop. It took a moment to collect my wits. Right, I just arrived at the Avia service station. Thank goodness I wasn't driving faster. I pulled up beside the building and turned off the engine. For a minute or two I sat, unnerved by everything. 
but it was time to call Jeremy. Do it now before the Kuwashis show up. So I grabbed my phone and entered the policeman's number from memory. The line rang twice before, Blanc! I smiled thinly as I recognized a voice I'd never chronologically heard. Hello, Agent Jeremy Blanc. My name is Kyle Stone. I am from Canada. I need to tell you some things about the terrorist activities around Paris. A silence occupied the line before Jeremy replied in English, Do I know you? How did you get my number? No, at this point in time you have never met me. But I want to help in this case, and I have been trying. I witnessed the shooting of the police officer in Montrouge this morning, and attempted to intervene before the shooter got away. His last name is Koulibaly. Another moment of silence. You were in Montrouge? Have you given your statement to police on the scene? No, but I am willing to tell police everything I know about it. And you know the shooter's last name is Koulibaly? What is his first name? I realized I didn't know and said so. But, I added, wanting to hurry the conversation along, I know he is connected with the Kuwashi brothers who attacked the Charlie Hebdo office. The shock felt by Jeremy could be sensed. How do you know all this? Are you part of their terrorist cell? No, no, I insisted. I am trying to help and protect people. I will tell you how I know this, but I want to do it in person. Right now I'm at the Avia service station near Villers-Cotterêts, northeast of Paris. I drove here in a rented car. I needed to come because the Kawashi brothers are about to rob this business. I will do what I can here. Send your forces, come yourself. I will wait for you here after all this is done. There was a tension in Jeremy's voice which disturbed me. Yes, you stay right there. The connection clicked off. That could have gone better. It's so hard talking to people when you have experienced what to them is future. I checked the time, 10.12 a.m. Okay, gotta go. With a prayer on my lips, I exited the car and went inside. Two employees worked inside. One greeted me. I went over to the coffee station and slowly prepared a cup for myself while scanning the rest of the store. No one else is here. Good. I walked to the counter, added a chocolate bar, and paid. Then I took a position by the newsstand to the left of the entry, where I could see outside. I pretended to look at the front page of a paper, which fittingly featured news about the Charlie Hebdo incident. When will they get here? Ironically, time seemed to have slowed to a standstill. I had just looked at my phone, 10.24 a.m., when a movement outside the building registered in my peripheral vision. A grey Renault Clio pulled into the filling area. I felt slightly annoyed. Customers. But in the next instant, two men sprang from the car. I recognized them. I'd just seen those two faces in the car which passed the Charlie Hebdo office twice in Paris. The brothers burst into the service station, leveling assault rifles at the clerks. A stand holding items for sale blocked me, for the moment, from their view. One of them elevated his gun and demanded fuel for their vehicle. In the action of raising his gun, the butt of the rifle nudged the terrorist's jacket pocket, and out fell a phone. It bounced twice and landed at my feet. In the intensity of the moment, absorbed with shouting at the clerks, the brothers didn't notice. Without thinking, I quickly snatched up the phone. In amazement, I saw the phone displayed the contact list. This is how I get it. I stuffed the phone into my pocket. One of the Kawashis, the older one, spotted me. He swung his gun around and pointed it at me. Terror! I held up my hands instantly. Mettez-vous là-bas! The gunman shouted, indicating with a jerk of his weapon that I should go stand with the clerks behind the till. I obeyed. One of the clerks went to fill the terrorist's car with gas. The younger Kuwashi went with him. The older brother ordered the remaining employee to fill a shopping bag with food and drinks. He too complied. I stood and watched, trembled but I knew what to do with the Kuwashi's phone if I had the chance. I must get the chance, I reasoned in fear and hope. I noticed a pen and notepad nearby on the counter. The waiting gunman began to lose patience with the progress of the gasoline fill. He took a step toward the entry to look. Whatever he saw in the filling area didn't please him. He opened the door and stepped outside, waving his free hand and shouting instructions. 
As soon as the door opened, I moved behind the clerk and withdrew the Kawashi phone from my pocket. I scrolled down the list of contacts until I spotted the name Kulabali. The first name, Amadi, appeared there too, and a phone number. I grabbed the pen and notepad and copied the number down as fast as possible. To my everlasting horror, the phone in my hand started to ring. The Kawashi by the door recognized the ringtone and darted back inside. He glared at me. I saw a chance. Is this yours? I asked in English, holding the phone up and then placing it hastily on the counter. I found it on the floor. I hope that doesn't get me shot. Kawashi stepped forward, took the phone, and silenced it. The other gunman and the clerk returned. The brothers demanded more food, then back toward the door. Ne pas la pas, la police, they warned as they exited. Their car soon sped back onto the N2, westward. Instantly, one clerk grabbed a phone. The other went to lock the front door. I breathed an immense sigh of relief. I took the notepad from the counter. The top paper held Amadi Kulabali's phone number. Just to be safe, I copied the number more neatly onto another piece of notepaper. I put the good copy in my jacket pocket and the original into my wallet. The time was now 10.38 a.m. The older clerk, clearly the manager, put down the phone. La police va bientôt arriver, he reported with a shaky voice. He added, Ce sont les terroristes Charlie Hebdo. He described the weaponry he had seen in the car while filling the tank. Still shaking a little, I prepared myself for an awkward encounter. At 10.45, two police cars screamed into the filling area. The manager unlocked the doors for the officers. A rapid exchange followed, which I couldn't keep up with. More police and emergency personnel vehicles arrived with each minute. Soon I heard the beating of helicopter blades, and two of the aircraft dropped from the sky. A whole team of police emerged, some in plain clothes, others in uniform. I recognized one of them as Jeremy. The helicopters took off again, no doubt in an attempt to locate the Kawashi vehicle. Jeremy and two other police nationale investigators entered the building and approached the store clerks and myself. Jeremy glanced at the uniforms of the two employees, then looked directly at me. Are you Kyle Stone? he asked. I opened my mouth to reply, but Jeremy had changed into a restaurant window. The warmth of the restaurant, La Nex, beckoned to me in the jangled collection of loose ends which currently totaled my existence. Charlie Hebdo, robbery at the hands of terrorists, police interrogation about to begin, police castaway. I was drained. So I went into the restaurant and took a seat, ordering coffee when the waitress inquired. I've had too much coffee already in this day, I mumbled, but I didn't care. So what to do now? On this Friday, Jeremy cannot help me anymore. No day skip has taken me past this day, so I have no way of knowing what will happen today or what I should aim for. So, do I sit and wait since I don't know of anything I can do? Somehow that didn't feel right. An unpleasant alternative occurred to me. Do I try to make something happen? My mind poked at the idea for a while. In the meantime, the tired waitress blandly asked if I wished for anything else. Not ready to leave. Where would I go? I asked to see a menu. Make something happen. What? How? The waitress left a menu for me while she tended other customers. I browsed the selections. Well, in terms of what to do, I will assume I'm supposed to remain involved in this whole terrorist activity affair. The Kuwashis, if I remember correctly what Jeremy said, are not in Paris. Sounds like the police will contain them soon. The waitress returned for my order. It was 1027. So, Kulabali, Jeremy said they don't know where he is or what he's up to. I took my wallet and found the notepaper containing Kulabali's phone number recorded at the service station. I could call Kulabali, try to find out what he's doing, where he is. My mouth went dry at the thought. But what would I say? And what would I do if I discovered anything? Jeremy and the police aren't able or willing to talk to me anymore. I thought. No answers. My order arrived. As I started into the food, I looked around the restaurant. A lady across the room caught my eye. For a moment, I thought it was Ingela, my Swedish roommate during the Toronto-Frankfurt flight. But no, that's not her. The memory of a conversation with Ingela resurfaced. 
Think about how to decide, not what to decide. How to decide? Pray. Look for God's leading as I'm going. Think on my feet. Act according to my values. Hmm. I hmmed a lot as I finished the meal. At 10.55, I slid my empty plate to the side. An idea was forming in terms of how to start the next move. Once again, I need strength, wisdom, and courage. As time switched to the next hour, I day-skipped.